Welcome to this episode of Robots in Depth. Today I'm honored to have Stefano Stami Joli from the University of Twente in the Netherlands here. I'm going to start the way I always start. How did you get into robotics? Why robotics and how, how did you get started? Is there something cooler than robotics? Uh, I don't think so, but <laughs> was it well, that I, that attracted you to it in the beginning? Actually, it started because when I was about uh, 12, I went, I think at 11, 12, uh, some, uh, around that age, um, Star Wars came out. And uh, I saw the movie with my dad, and I was, I said, you know, when I saw the, the robots there, I said, oh, this is too cool. That is what I'm going to do when I'm big. I always liked technology, and uh, that's basically the passion started there. And and then I I built my first robot, Six Degrees of Freedom. I did electronics, everything when I was 16. I actually manufactured it uh, uh, myself with the help of some people from mechanics. Interesting, interesting. What kind of robot was that? It was a manipulator. Ah, uh, so an, an arm then? Yes, an arm. I was using stepper motor, and uh, I did the. Uh, uh, actually, was a, the controller was based on a Z80 uh, microprocessor yes. in which I did a, a learning system all written in an assembler to learn the, the module of motion. And then I connected to an Apple IIe those time. Mm -hmm. And a certain, I even burned the I.O. to, to do working on that. And then I, I actually could repair the motherboard myself for those time. Something unthinkable now. And that is, well, it started there. And then, uh, uh, well, the rest is... This is all from there, basically. Yeah, and if you start at that level, building your own motherboards and doing all this thing, I mean, you got to be doing some really hefty stuff to beat the 16-year-old yourself, right? the 16-year-old you that back in history. That's an amazing start, huh? Was it very hard for you to do that? Was it reasonably accessible, or I mean, no, it's it's it's. I mean, I think if there is a way of saying, it. I mean, if you have passion and, and you like things, you find a way to do it, right? Mm, so. Mm. I was doing a technical school before going to university, and um, and uh, I would do actually computer science, so that that was my my major. Uh, but I was helped with uh, by by people that do you know were building a milling machine and stuff, so they actually helped me to use them because I had no experience whatsoever with this stuff. And then I had my own lab at home. I built my own lab with my electronics oscilloscope. I bought with some money some oscilloscope and. I was building the electronics uh, a motherboard with, uh, uh, you know, with acids to make the boards and this kind of stuff. The old Very board. fundamentally, <laughs> that's that's hardcore. Well, I would say that's old school and hardcore. Yes, doing the motherboards yourself, not sending them out for to do it to maybe any in China. Yeah, I mean the old Apple uh, uh, computer, personal mm -hmm. computer era. Mm -hmm was when that's time, right? Mm. So I, I mm. actually have good memories and all the story of the involvement of Microsoft and Apple. Right? Amazing, amazing stuff. Mm. Uh, th that's why it's so amazing to do this show, because I get to hear about how you do all this crazy <laughs> stuff. So then you went on from there. Could we end? What, what, you made this manipulator, this yes. arm. What, did you do anything interesting with it when you when, when actually, it was finished? Actually, when I graduated, it was, uh, was not required. This is for techno school, so it's like uh, when you're 18, more or less. Mm -hmm. So eventually, uh, at the end, uh, there was no requirement to make a project, but I just did it because I wanted to show something cool. And actually, I poured water to drink to the people at the commission, and they were like looking at that. So it was uh, it was pretty satisfying the reaction. I, have to say. I must say, I must say, it must have been enormous because okay. we're talking a long time ago, or not yes. too long time ago, yeah, but a significant well, time ago. Yeah, it's, it's a long time ago. Because, yeah. uh, and uh, yeah, in eighty, probably have to think about it. it was eighty nine, eighty. Yeah. No, no, earlier, even earlier. Because I graduated in uh, in uh, ninety two, mm -hmm. so it was earlier. Than so so much of what we're taking for granted now that that just works didn't wasn't even conceived by then. So you, you must have overcome some enormous challenges. No, well, it was more like uh, driven by. I remember, for example, uh, that when I said, "Okay, I want to build a manipulator," mm -hmm. I was looking for literature and and uh, you know, looking at uh, what is a homogeneous matrix and this kind of stuff, you know. But the, the background I had at that level of, of mathematics was still small. Mm -hmm. But I kind of worked things out and I was more driven by, by passion and finding solution ad hoc, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Of course, then things changed in my career, but that was 
was the, the, the motivation, I think, you know, mm. with you have motivation, you can do anything, mm. which is possible mm. physically, I think. Yeah, yeah, and I think that I see that in the students I meet at these events, and I also feel it in myself, and I also remember my, my younger self, uh, and I, it, it, you do these hard things, and then you achieve them, and it, that's the best feeling I've ever had. Yes. And also, I, I, a friend of mine mentioned that why he became an entrepreneur was that when he was when he was doing that, he felt like a superhero because he, because he could achieve so much. And I think that that's, that's all the reward you need. You, you get that feeling, I did something amazing and yeah. it worked. It yeah. Beeping worked, yeah. right? That's, that's the best feeling ever. Yeah, absolutely. And then you went on to become a researcher and do well, that? Then I, I got a, a, a graduation in computer science, basically, and, and I decided, you know, I want to go to, to university for sure. And then I went to, to engineering, and actually when I started engineering, uh, um, I, was, I, I discovered that I really, really liked uh, fundamental uh, analysis. Uh, so I really got the passion for mathematics and, and, and more fundamental analysis. Uh, and then I, I was one of the first Erasmus students of those time, when the Erasmus program started, and I went to England. And those, those years I was interested also in telecommunication. But in England, I had the opportunity to work with control, and, and I said, oh, "Come, on, this is much much cooler than, than than telecommunication." At least that was my my feeling then. So basically, I got back to control, and then uh, back to robotics. And my graduation at the University of Bologna was on a, on a redundancy algorithm to, for coordinating the the robotic hand from Bologna and and the arm. Mm -hmm. And, and then we're getting seriously into robotics yeah, because that that's was, hard. That's yeah. hard stuff. Huh? Yeah, that was my, my uh, the first paper. Mm -hmm. It was actually my graduation, uh, master graduation. And and then uh, you know love brings you somewhere else. So for 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 a personal reason, I actually I wanted to go to to the U.S. But I ended up in the Netherlands, uh, and I've been uh, actually there since then. During my PhD, PhD period, I spent time at MIT and the University of Arizona, but uh, I've been in the Netherlands for half of my life now. Mm, mm, mm. That's also great that we see Europe integrating more and that you can go wherever you want to and just explore the, the possibilities. Huh? Yes. Uh, so what do you do at the university? I, I have the pleasure and honor to lead a pretty big lab. We are talking about 50, 60 people. Uh, and uh, it's a lab which, when I took it over, was a, a control lab. It's actually, I, I kind of really made it a, a robotics lab, robotics and electronics, that's the name of the lab. And uh, um, we have a number of, of research lines, and uh, we work on a, a, a inspection and maintenance robotics and medical applications, and, and other few, few things. But we have a, a big lab with all manufacturing facilities, so we actually build complete system. So we have people that uh, work on software, people that uh, work on design, control, mm -hmm. modeling, and actually now we're just expanding with some colleagues working on, on rapid manufacturing research lines. Mm. Uh, to, to, to adapt to Industry 4.0, that everything should be customized to a particular customer and, and you have to really have short setup because otherwise the product won't be feasible. Huh? No, it's more like, you know, you, you want to, uh, I think the goal of university is to, to be innovative and, and, and not create products, even if we have a lot of spin-offs. You know, we just have a pleasure, we, we won recently the tech transfer award with our robotic bird, for example. Mm. The, uh, yeah, I've heard about that one. ERF uh, tech transfer award. But what we do is really um, starting from very theoretical spanning to a, to a prototype, a demonstrator, and I think, you know, robotics at the end of the day uh, integrating things is a science on itself, even if it's not considered as such often. But, and we really look at not only at cons, and sometimes a concept is important, sometimes you want to show that something works. And, and, and also, for example, if you look at the medical field, uh, you need a lot of domain knowledge, uh, the, which you need to use in order to, to, to uh, basically show that what you're doing is meaningful. So you have to, you have to be good at hardware, software, and then you have to uh, connect to the domain experts and, and really work with them uh, to make all this work. And I, I understand that that's hugely challenging. Yeah. Yes, and we also, what is special is that in, in Twente we have a technical medicine in the study which is pretty unique worldwide actually, where people that graduate are half engineer and half clinician basically. Mm. And in my lab uh, there is a part-time radiologist and a part-time surgeon. 
uh, one day a week they are there and so you you, you have the domain expertise in the lab mm -hmm. which makes it even more more interesting. Mm, very nice. And th this is actually why I'm in. I'm actually a mechanical engineer by training and a computer programmer by vocation in an earlier career. But that's also why I love robotics, because we're out here, <coughs> we're changing the real world, we're, we, we're out doing real stuff rather than the computer, which is great. But I find the robotics, the being out there in the real world, so fascinating. Yes. Uh, and there, as you see, you have software, hardware, and then even a, a surgeon in the other end that you're trying to assist. And, and also social part. Eh? So that's not my work in Twente, but I have a colleague, Vanessa Evers, that is actually looking at the social robotics. Mm. Okay. So then, I mean, it's also the context in which you work. Surgeon is one side. Mm. But if you have more interactions, then also the other things play a major role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. So you do the the surgical robots. Do you, do you do other? Have you other focuses in the lab also? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, uh, we have a number of European projects running mm -hmm. at the moment. Uh, the two major lines that I did just described are the major line, but mm -hmm. another very cool is one of my favorite things that I'm working is this robotic bird. Mm -hmm. It is uh, there is a spin-off. You know, it's a business, a running business, successful business. But I have some ideas that I want to exploit for the future mm. to, to really look at, you know, uh, years ahead mm. to make really deformable wings and stuff like that. Because it's a, it's a bird that flies at 80 kilometers an hour in 5 or 4 winds, so it's pretty unique. I mean, there is nothing like that uh, elsewhere. And uh, we, are, we have some smaller activity in uh, agricultural robotics. Mm. Uh, we are contacted by an enterprise in the, re the region. Uh, and basically, we're looking at some navigation problems in in, uh, uh, in you know in agriculture applications. Mm. Uh, is it field robotics or is it uh, indoors or? No, it's field. So basically, uh, there is a, 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 a new system that this enterprise is developed. It's called the Innovado, and that basically needs to out completely autonomous navigate in the in the farm, go and get uh, uh, they call it the, um, uh, the hay for from mm. and then mix it. And then bring it to the cows and, uh, and spread it out basically all in autonomous. Yeah. yeah, I understand that agriculture is a sector where automation and robotics is making great, great headways, and there's also lots of interest from the farmers and the, and the users, right? It's one of the most successful robotics business uh, because if you think about Lely, it's, uh, it's a Dutch enterprise uh, who is a world leader in, in milking machines. Milking robots. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this has been a huge success uh, worldwide. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, so, where do you, I mean? You have a long-term overview of the progress of robotics, and yeah. you've been able to study many small streams, different sensors, different yes. hardware and software. Where do you see the biggest pro pro progress now, and that could then re result in new applications? Yeah. Well, I think that uh, there is a misconception, certainly, I mean, people in the field do not have this misconception, I think, but in the general public, at least, there is a huge misconception of what are the big challenges, I think. Mm. That's uh, why we're here, that's why I do this show, because I get you to tell the people the truth. Yeah, it's, it's you know, when people, have, I, I have a lot of context also for, for positions uh, that I have in, in the Netherlands and the European, with governments or people that are not from the field. And they say, you know, now what is going to happen with artificial intelligence? You know, now we have computers that can solve problems, win games, etc., mm -hmm. uh, etc. Et so people think that the only problems in the robotics are, are uh, related to AI, mm -hmm. which is, of course, our big problems, and there are a lot of, of uh, advances there. But I think there are, uh, it's a misconception because, on one side, uh, AI and uh, uh, applied to, 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 to certain let's say image classification or things like that is one thing uh, you know handling objects manipulation perception on, on the haptical side mm -hmm. and coordination of these cues it's a very different game and I said that also another thing which is which you are far from from being close to human is is the hands I mean yeah. uh, uh, there are fantastic hands around uh, um, but I mean, the, 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 as, as people know, you know, big part of our cortex is, is used to just to manipulate the hand. And, and, and the manipulability that we have in our hand is, you know, I don't think I will see a robotic hand working like a human hand before I die, so to speak. So I think those, 
it is not only on the computer science artificial intelligence uh, level that this is playing a role, but I think that also the, uh, the, the dexterity uh, uh, and uh, safety and compliance, uh, I think actuators mm. are, are one fundamental thing. There is a lot of interest and I, I was happy to be part of a FET project, successful project by actors uh, with a number of, of uh, esteemed colleagues. And uh, that was a fantastic project, you know, it was a start of doing uh, variable compliance actuators, which, you know, humans are, are so ac extraordinary because they have extraordinary actuators yeah. as well. So these are the challenges, I think. That and I also think that um, since actuation, as you say, the hand is limited, intelligence is limited, um, I think that we're going to see a bottom-up approach from robotics. We're not going to see them pop out and take over the world or, or start to, to write the yeah. next novel or, or do things like that. We're going to see uh, every year your robotic vacuum cleaner and your robotic lawnmower is going to be just that tad little bit better. Yes. And, and suddenly every five years we're going to see, okay, now we, we started with the lawnmower and now we have the vacuum cleaner and then we're going to have the house cleaning robot. And this, they're going to take a small, the, the first version is going to be really bad, they're going to have severe limitations. But we're going to see this, everything is going to be a little bit better and pops up new application. And they're really bad in their beginning, but then they just suddenly they're like yeah. the cell phone. I had a cell phone maybe 25 years ago, and they were really, really bad. Yeah. And now they're amazing, right? It's, it's, uh, it, it's true. I mean, I think that uh, the way I, uh, for instance, certain applications like uh, inspection and service, mm -hmm. I think that the goal now is to make hardware that works and it doesn't break down. And then, uh, you know, telemanipulated. That is going to be the other way, mm. and and then uh, bit by bit you will increase the intelligence by an app kind of model mm. in which they will be you will make this machine more and more intelligent, mm. and bit by bit the human will do less and less, mm. uh, but there will be a very long time in the loop, mm. and also this old discussion you know uh, that is always saying uh, robots are killing jobs uh, mm. kind of discussions you know people I think have a very wrong. Idea. I mean, of course, there are a lot of things that will be taken over. As I said, as a hand, mm. I mean, uh, there will be no robots doing things that people do by hand. No, no doubt about it. Mm. And and of, uh, as long as I'm concerned, I see two phases in in this. So the first phase is the one that people think that robot will take over, which is not going to happen, in my opinion. Mm. Is this phase where you will have a, a pervasive uh, robotic technology coming in? But, um, and, and, and basically, uh, there will be a collaboration between robots and humans. Mm. And then far, far away, uh, I'll be dead by then, uh, you know, the, we will have robots that can do basically everything. Mm. And, uh, and then, you know, the issue is not more technological, uh, uh, but it's more like economical, macroeconomical, because then, you know, wealth will be generated by robots mm. and people like wealth is generated by el electricity today yeah, the only th the only source would be the only problem would be uh, you know taking energy but the mm. sun will have enough energy to do everything so basically people will not need to work if they don't want to mm. more and i don't know what your view is when it comes to the intellectual ai do you think that an ai could go out and not compose more mozart music but actually look at Mozart, Beethoven, Bach and say, ah, I can do this kind of music that's totally different, but also beautiful. What do you think about that? Uh, well, I, I think that we'll get there. Mm. I think that, you know, um, I, I, I happen that music is one of my hobby, by the way. But I think that uh, we will get there. So, uh, I mean, what, what is creativity is, is part of inner creativity, but it's just there have been study that, that has shown that you know many of the things we actually create have been inspired by other things that we see and that we kind of generalize those concepts. On the shoulder of giants is what everybody Yeah, says, but also right? things that are completely unrelated to the goal you eventually use them for. But of course if you have a, a database of knowledge which is so big because you can access all the data uh, and you can try to explore and extrapolate this data, it would not surprise me and because, you know, music has certain rules that, you know, that something sounds well if it's done in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And those rules you learn as a human, as a musician, in order to, to, to compose. Mm -hmm. So I think that, uh, I think that actually, uh, I believe that one day we will have pretty cool music pieces maybe 
uh, uh, composed by, by, by artificial intelligence. I think that that will happen. Yeah, that's going to be and cool. And hopefully it's going to be better than the, the rubbish music that nowadays people do with, the, you know, just putting things together and then they don't like it. Yeah, <laughs> when it comes to music, very, very many are cold, very few are suitable. Uh, I heard that in some years, in, in the early 18th, uh, late 1800s, there was 40,000 operas written a year. And we probably have 20 of them left, yeah. <laughs> because the other ones yeah. were just pure rubbage, right? Yeah. So that, that, that's also, I mean, we're, when we do things as human, we're self-critical. We say, ah, that was probably not my best work. I'm not going to show anybody that. I wonder if we can develop a self-critical robot that says that that probably wasn't my best. <laughs> op that wasn't my best opera. I'll, I'll leave that alone for a while. I need to polish it a bit more. But this is very, I mean, and the intelligence behind the robot is very challenging and a very interesting field. Um, so if you look at the whole field, you talked about the bird, you talk about surgical robots. Where do you see the ne next big breakthrough that could be possible because you know the underlying technologies are ready for it? Well, I, I, uh, the two, not for nothing, I think the two things uh, that I mentioned, uh, medical and, and inspection of services, I think that those two are the, actually the, the two fields where they can, we can be very successful as a community. Because for the following reasons, uh, I mean, it is uh, recognized by a surgeon that a surgeons will will not have a job in a few years. Well, in a few years, a few number, decades, a few uh, maybe a few decades. Mm. The issue is, of course, a lot of the things that are not done now uh, by hand uh, is uh, they will be replaced by the imaging imaging that we have. Mm. I mean, MRI can see things that you know, the very high precision. We we are heading to. A nine Tesla MRI, which can see very very small details inside the body. Now the issue in real is time, that, huh? and then you can couple in, so you can do image guided interventions, and then you can basically uh, 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 target lesions of tumors and ablate them uh, without even operating. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so uh, I think that this kind of research—that's what we're doing. We have a number of MRI compatible robots in the lab, actually. Crazy enough, we haven't published anything yet, but we'll come you, out hear, with you heard it here first, you know. We'll come, we'll come uh, out with a number of these things, and um, so I think that will be a line which will uh, legislation is an issue there. Medical field is that's a big problem. Yeah, you have to be also for our bird, that's a really big issue. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the issue with uh, the issue with the medical field? I understand it has to be certified, but what was the issue with the bird? As because a, a little bird, bird of this size mm -hmm. should satisfy the same law of a seven four. That's that's the yeah, okay. That's more or less I'm exaggerating, but it is the problem. You cannot just fly on a professional level. People can fly this if they do it for fun, mm -hmm. but uh, when you want to to earn money with that, mm -hmm. it's a completely different ball game. Ah, so okay, this is okay. this is really a big because problem. you're not carrying a human. Uh, no, no, no. But if it falls from the sky mm -hmm. on the head of somebody, die, and you know it, it could kill somebody, they say. Uh, so these are is the it that, is, is, You think it's heavy enough to do no, that? No, no, no. It's I mean it's 700, 800 grams. It should come at a breakneck speed. And to it kill will someone. not f fall down like a stone. So, uh, but I mean these are just the regulations. People yeah. are looking at the European level. I mean there is a lot going on mm -hmm. to drones, but. You know, on the other hand, bad side of the story is that there are a lot of uh, problems with drones, for absolutely, example. Absolutely, absolutely. They fly in no-fly zones, they and get caught up with high-power lines. They're really spoiling the field for, uh, for in different ways. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. They, by the inspection of services, something else where we, uh, uh, we have the possibility to really make a difference because for safety. For example, another project which we, we are pretty unique, we have, I think, the, the only robot which can travel uh, in pipe of uh, five, 52 millimeter inner diameters and travel through T junctions and move around. Um, that is, you know, there is cool, cool hardware that uh, that you have. Now, if you make it, you you can bring it in a way that the intelligence should leave it to the operator side, kind of. And then, as I said before, then you can build it up and make it more intelligent, and then go into a swarm of robots that will, you know, 24/7 inspect the, the gas mains and try to find uh, leaks, and, leaks and stuff like that. Because nowadays what happens, at least in the Netherlands, you know, there is a regulation that you have to, to inspect uh, the pipes from outside. Mm -hmm. And there is a guy who, you know, knows, has a map more or less where the, li where the gas lines are. Mm -hmm. And he just, with a sniffer, goes around. And if you smell something, then, you know, 
there is already actually it's already too late because there is a leakage. Yeah, and it's right? been that for quite a long and, time. And right? maybe it doesn't even measure because the wind is going in the wrong direction, so to speak. So well, you heard the leak is just many, many, many small leaks rather than one big one. That's right? correct. So uh, uh, and and then you know you can have an explosion, people can die. Mm. Instead, if you are inside the pipe and you can navigate, you can even measure the stress in the pipe, mm. and you don't need you know uh, you can predict that something is going to happen. Mm. So I think these two lines are something that you know uh, if. Uh, the whole ecosystem will really start investing in that and, and seeing and, and it's happening actually but we will make a big difference in in, in, in society mm. and you might also be be able to repair and maintain the pipe from the inside rather than dig up the street again it would yes. probably be enormously much easier just from a practical point of view and of course you don't have to turn you have to, you don't have to block the road and, and do all that work well, it's, it's actually it's it's even even uh, halfway there is something already interesting because you know uh, repairing it will be done first you want to navigate and measure and, and, and do inspection mm. but the cool thing is that when you in, when you measure uh, uh, that there is a leakage mm. you don't know exactly where it is mm. so you have to make a big hole on mm. the street mm. because you know you have to find where this leakage is instead if you can drive through the pipe mm. you can acoustically detect the leakage very precisely mm. and then you could send a signal and say you know this is where you have to dig mm. and you could dig a very small hole mm. without mm. you know stopping Just traffic drill down, down more or less rather than actually for digging. example yeah. But do you think also it would be possible to actually just fix the leak from the inside? Yes, it would be possible. Yeah, just sure. put a spe speck of glue on the hole. Yeah, polymers. Depends, of mm. course, what kind of materials yeah. you have and, uh, and the carrying. But mm. the robot we've developed is very modular. Mm. And, and I love modular robotics. <laughs> That's my passion. You know that. <laughs> so if you, if, you, if you now have uh, uh, proven and, and developed this, then at a certain point you can uh, actually uh, uh, create new modules. Mm. To, to basically, you know, repair things. And then also another thing, another project I mentioned but is also pretty interesting is with police. Mm -hmm. We are cooperation with the Dutch police mm -hmm. uh, department. Because mm -hmm. now for, for uh, you know, terrorists, mm -hmm. uh, terrorism and all these big problems on our time, um, um, you know, uh, when they have a, um, when they have to, to deploy robots, you know, they dif have different robots with different user interfaces. Mm -hmm. And uh, they need to combine with sensors which have not done by were well, not made by the same enterprise. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, developed paradigms which we showed in in practice, and we are working uh, still on that, which uses DDS as a as a standard middleware. Mm -hmm. Is actually a completely modular system which you basically take a robot, you you plug in the sensor, and they automatically uh, use a coded transmission layer where you have one interface in which you can control all robots at the same time. Mm, mm. And all these kind of things are, are, you know, are challenging because from a software point of view, you know, they have to be uh, dependability, reliability, they are very important issues. Mm. But once this works, uh, I mean, it, it really makes a difference mm, mm. because you can have an operation planned and executed much faster than mm. it's now. Um, we all talk about artificial intelligent limitation artificial limitations in artificial intelligence and stuff like that but where do you see other limitations sensors batteries actuators are there any actuators, real yeah. problems and what do you see for solutions i think that the actuators are, are uh, i mean sensing we are getting pretty far i think mm. i mean processing is an issue but i think that you know things are going actuation is harder because mm. you have a volumetric capacity Mm. and energetic consumption which mm. is a, an mm. important thing muscles are very very special things mm. and you know we have incredible hands with a lot of muscles mm. uh, in the forearm and we can do a lot of things so um it, we are far from 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 being as capable uh, in actuations mm. so we, we finally recognize that you know variable compliance is is one of the key technology for for actually interaction with the environment to be uh, robust or to tune ver you know precision uh, versus uh, uh, safety and robustness kind of thing but we, we still have a lot of work to do in order to make uh, actuators which are you know as volumetrically efficient as you know human uh, actuators human muscles and and also they they have the same similar energy consumption towards the end now we've talked about all these interesting things uh, what would you say is the true potential of robotics rather than what we hear m about in the mainstream media? Is there anything that you hear about that you say, oh, that's never going to happen? Or you say that, why aren't they talking about this? Because this is really going to happen. 
Well, I think that um, uh, we should be careful in the community. Mm -hmm. I think uh, a lot is going on, so we are really go going faster and faster. But I think that an important issue is that, uh, uh, you know, there was an effect uh, in, in AI years and years ago, the AI winter, where people, you know, said that they were going to repeat to, to create the brain, you know, kind of. And at a certain point, the things they were saying just were not done, and, and research finances for research in that direction disappeared mm. and the field, the, 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 the field were actually in this AI winter. Now we should be careful I think as, as a community in robotics I and mean, we can do a lot mm. uh, but we, sh we should be realistic in certain sense. You, you, we should keep on dreaming, mm. that's not what I'm saying, but saying that you know don't say to uh, to people that don't are not able to judge from you know, with the technological insight Tomorrow we'll have a humanoid which can clean and do whatever with the wash and whatever at home. You know, because people then are not able to discriminate on what actually that means. They think there will be a robot that does exactly the same as a human can do. Mm. And that's and dangerous. do it the same way also. Also doing the same way. And that is kind of dangerous because, you know, people say, okay, that's great, and they wait for it. And then, you know, if two years later, three years later, these things say, where is this robot, you know? Mm. And if it's not there, people then will start believing that robotics cannot deliver what they say. Mm. Instead, I think that uh, that ro robotics, as mm. you know, can change the world in a in a in a in a good way, mm. uh, if properly used. I mean, as every technology can have bad sides as well. But mm. if it's well, properly it's used, I think really robotics can s contribute to solve all the big challenges in our you know in the world basically. Mm. But we should also be very careful what we promise when we promise mm. and how we promise. And if, uh, if I have the chance, you know, to, to in, in this direction, for example, with the activity we have uh, in the lab to, to make a small contribution in, this, in tackling problems, uh, for example, of breast cancer, which is mm. one of the like, mm. you know, then that is very satisfying. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you very much for taking the time to do an interview. It was a pleasure to have you here and I hope to see you soon again. Thank you very much. This episode is sponsored by Aptomica. Everything you need in modular robotics. Or robots up close. What's going on in robotics, online and on the road. If you like this interview, don't forget to subscribe, follow us on Twitter and subscribe to our email newsletter on robotsindepth.com. You can also support the show on Patreon.